Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear two students talking about spending a gap year in Australia before going to university. Now look at questions one and two. During my gap year in Australia, I met so many other Brits my age doing the same thing before going to uni back in the UK. They'd all done the same journey out there via Southeast Asia, stopping off briefly in Thailand and Bali on the way. Really unmissable places with jaw-dropping scenery. I made some good friends travelling in Australia in my gap year. So often people claimed their main motivation for going was the unspoilt beaches, the wildlife, the rainforests, the endless sunshine. But that's true for lots of destinations. I actually think the major additional lure is that there's one obstacle you don't have to overcome. Worrying about asking for directions or how to get around, which could be pretty daunting if you're staying somewhere for a while. It's a massive country and surprisingly pricey. I took the bus between cities. Flying really defeats the object of travel. So much of the country's character is revealed in those vast distances of pure nothingness. I did struggle to make ends meet. I earned a bit doing bits and pieces of work here and there. It wasn't easy to come by. Rather than pay high rent, I stayed in basic hostels. But it was good. I kept bumping into the same people, all on a tight budget, of course. Now listen again. During my gap year in Australia, I met so many other Brits my age doing the same thing before going to uni back in the UK. They'd all done the same journey out there via Southeast Asia, stopping off briefly in Thailand and Bali on the way. Really unmissable places with jaw-dropping scenery. I made some good friends travelling in Australia in my gap year. So often people claimed their main motivation for going was the unspoilt beaches, the wildlife, the rainforests, the endless sunshine. But that's true for lots of destinations. I actually think the major additional lure is that there's one obstacle you don't have to overcome. Worrying about asking for directions or how to get around, which could be pretty daunting if you're staying somewhere for a while. It's a massive country and surprisingly pricey. I took the bus between cities. Flying really defeats the object of travel. So much of the country's character is revealed in those vast distances of pure nothingness. I did struggle to make ends meet. I earned a bit doing bits and pieces of work here and there. It wasn't easy to come by. Rather than pay high rent, I stayed in basic hostels. But it was good. I kept bumping into the same people, all on a tight budget, of course. Extract two. You hear two friends discussing the purpose of travelling. Now listen to questions three and four. You're busy planning your next trip, Ollie. Do you always feel a sense of purpose to your travels? To be honest, I might sometimes have felt like I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. That's not often the case, but I do think you need to get off the beaten track. I try to go to new places. Once there, I'm a fan of just hanging out and trying to get to understand the vibe of a place and observe the way of life. I make a point of asking questions so I can find places where I can chill out and discover what's going on, rather than ticking it off as a place I've done because I went on some amazing tour to a waterfall or got a great picture of a tiger. 
You travel. What motivates you? For me, it's about stepping out of my comfort zone. Traveling alone gives you experiences that teach you about yourself. It's funny how what might have been a really bad experience, say getting lost or missing the only bus that day, can turn into an anecdote, which makes you see things differently. Having a story that ends up making your friends laugh is quite cool, really. Anyway, I've realized that although I'm pretty tough, tears come too easily when I'm tired and someone shouts at me. Now listen again. You're busy planning your next trip, Ollie. Do you always feel a sense of purpose to your travels? To be honest, I might sometimes have felt like I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. That's not often the case, but I do think you need to get off the beaten track. I try to go to new places. Once there, I'm a fan of just hanging out and trying to get to understand the vibe of a place and observe the way of life. I make a point of asking questions so I can find places where I can chill out and discover what's going on. Rather than ticking it off as a place I've done because I went on some amazing tour to a waterfall or got a great picture of a tiger, you travel. What motivates you? For me, it's about stepping out of my comfort zone. Traveling alone gives you experiences that teach you about yourself. It's funny how what might have been a really bad experience, say getting lost or missing the only bus that day, can turn into an anecdote, which makes you see things differently. Having a story that ends up making your friends laugh is quite cool, really. Anyway, I've realized that although I'm pretty tough, tears come too easily when I'm tired and someone shouts at me. Extract three. You hear two colleagues talking about a trip to a conference. Now listen to questions five and six. So, flying to Edinburgh tomorrow for the conference. I can't wait. Why so keen? We've both got to give talks tomorrow that very afternoon. I know. I should really be looking at my presentation and going over my latest improvements so I remember them. I've been through it quite thoroughly, so I'm happy that the slides won't need to be altered. You swore you'd listen to me go through mine one more time today. There's no cause to doubt my word. You'd better not be joking about that. On condition you listen to my delivery too. Sure. Anyway, I've no intention of making any major adjustments. I just appreciate some constructive criticism about whether I'm pausing in the right places or speaking too fast. You know the sort of thing. Absolutely, that's what I need too. It'll be a relief not to be stuck in this cramped office. The renovations to our old one must have been going on for at least two months now. The prospect of getting away makes up for the weeks of preparation. Anyway. I've made a point of packing light, so as not to have to drag a heavy case onto the airport train. I'd far rather have taken a taxi there. If only I'd been in charge of organising things. Now listen again. So, flying to Edinburgh tomorrow for the conference. I can't wait. Why so keen? We've both got to give talks tomorrow that very afternoon. I know. I should really be looking at my presentation and going over my latest improvements so I remember them. I've been through it quite thoroughly, so I'm happy that the slides won't need to be altered. You swore you'd listen to me go through mine one more time today. There's no cause to doubt my word. You'd better not be joking about that. On condition you listen to my delivery too. Sure. Anyway, I've no intention of making any major adjustments. I just appreciate some constructive criticism about whether I'm pausing in the right places or speaking too fast. You know the sort of thing. Absolutely, that's what I need too. It'll be a relief not to be stuck in this cramped office. The renovations to our old one must have been going on for at least two months now. The prospect of getting away makes up for the weeks of preparation. Anyway, 
I've made a point of packing light so as not to have to drag a heavy case onto the airport train. I'd far rather have taken a taxi there. If only I'd been in charge of organising things. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a talk by a woman called Ellie Matthews about her life working as a writer and illustrator of children's books. For, qu For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. It's a pleasure to be here and tell you about my life as an illustrator and children's author, a profession I really just fell into. It's not as if my art teacher or parents spotted any artistic skills in me when I was a young girl. They tended to focus on my vivid imagination. I was always entertaining my friends with outrageous stories and so not really seen as a good influence at all. However, I loved painting and opted to attend art college. By graduation, I'd accumulated a sizable portfolio of work to showcase my talents and applied for jobs. I remember one was a position at a major art gallery. I didn't get it, fortunately, as it turns out, but I felt crushed to be rejected for that and for a role at a big advertising agency. I do sometimes wonder how differently things might have panned out for me. Anyway, I earned virtually nothing for two years just bits and pieces doing illustrations for magazines and some work on a children's comic. The only financially rewarding thing I did in those early years as an illustrator was for travel brochures, but I wasn't enamoured by the idea of doing that forever. Meanwhile, I'd been writing and drawing pictures for a children's book of my own about a girl called Carly. I sent the finished manuscript to various publishers and was stunned one day to hear that one of them wanted to publish it. To my amazement, the first edition of Carly flew off the shelves in bookshops. I think it was her red hair that made her such a distinctive character. She was a skinny little girl with super thick glasses, somewhat based on my schoolgirl self. One source of inspiration for things she did and felt was going through letters written to my grandmother by my mum when I was young. They stirred my own vivid recollections, like reading old diaries, I guess where the mention of some event or person triggers memories of a whole period of childhood. Anyway, after Carly, I left Britain for the USA. I'd been taken there a lot as a child. My mother's parents lived there. I don't deal well with the cold in Britain, and I loved the friendliness over there. In addition, I've always adored its open spaces, and that's what influenced me to make the move to live and work there, rather than the weather. It's just so vast. I now share an apartment in New England with my husband and kids. In my studio, I have all the equipment I need. My drawing tools are pretty standard, though there are certain kinds of pens for fine lines I prefer and one specific brand of brush pens for more fluid lines. It's paper I'm terribly picky about. I can waste time with false starts if it isn't what I work best on. Marker pens, coloured pencils and inks are also essential tools of the trade. Being a mother has changed me. I've had to learn patience. I've always been interested in the way children see things and I love their funny expressions. I see every child as unique. That's the wisdom I've gained and imparting it to my readers is a mission of mine. People believe children will bring them happiness. But it's more complex than that.
Now listen again. It's a pleasure to be here and tell you about my life as an illustrator and children's author, a profession I really just fell into. It's not as if my art teacher or parents spotted any artistic skills in me when I was a young girl. They tended to focus on my vivid imagination. I was always entertaining my friends with outrageous stories, and so not really seen as a good influence at all. However, I loved painting and opted to attend art college. By graduation, I'd accumulated a sizable portfolio of work to showcase my talents and applied for jobs. I remember one was a position at a major art gallery. I didn't get it, fortunately, as it turns out, but I felt crushed to be rejected for that and for a role at a big advertising agency. I do sometimes wonder how differently things might have panned out for me. Anyway, I earned virtually nothing for two years. Just bits and pieces, doing illustrations for magazines and some work on a children's comic. The only financially rewarding thing I did in those early years as an illustrator was for travel brochures, but I wasn't enamoured by the idea of doing that forever. Meanwhile, I'd been writing and drawing pictures for a children's book of my own about a girl called Carly. I sent the finished manuscript to various publishers and was stunned one day to hear that one of them wanted to publish it. To my amazement, the first edition of Carly flew off the shelves in bookshops. I think it was her red hair that made her such a distinctive character. She was a skinny little girl with super thick glasses, somewhat based on my schoolgirl self. One source of inspiration for things she did and felt was going through letters written to my grandmother by my mum when I was young. They stirred my own vivid recollections, like reading old diaries, I guess. Where the mention of some event or person triggers memories of a whole period of childhood. Anyway, after Carly, I left Britain for the USA. I'd been taken there a lot as a child. My mother's parents lived there. I don't deal well with the cold in Britain, and I loved the friendliness over there. In addition, I've always adored its open spaces, and that's what influenced me to make the move to live and work there rather than the weather. It's just so vast. I now share an apartment in New England with my husband and kids. In my studio, I have all the equipment I need. My drawing tools are pretty standard, though there are certain kinds of pens for fine lines I prefer, and one specific brand of brush pens for more fluid lines. It's paper I'm terribly picky about. I can waste time with false starts if it isn't what I work best on. Marker pens, coloured pencils, and inks are also essential tools of the trade. Being a mother has changed me. I've had to learn patience. I've always been interested in the way children see things, and I love their funny expressions. I see every child as unique. That's the wisdom I've gained, and imparting it to my readers is a mission of mine. People believe children will bring them happiness, but it's more complex than that. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear two students called Jolie and Alan talking about a TV series they watch called The Sensing Brain. For questions fifteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have seventy seconds to look at part three.
So, Alan, did you see the latest episode of The Sensing Brain? Yes, Jolie. It was interesting. So I gather from the reviews. I missed it, so you can tell me about it, though I'll probably watch it online. There was this woman who's an expert on perfume making and runs workshops on the subject. It seems humans can improve their sense of smell fairly rapidly with practice. Even those who are convinced they've got a terrible one can prove pretty adept if they apply themselves. I wonder if it's like music. If you haven't studied or listened to a lot, you're hard pushed to spot the difference between a clarinet and an oboe. But once you've put in some time, you can distinguish them effortlessly. Apparently so, even if you haven't done specialist training. I learned a bit about perfumes, actually. There's an amazing range of terms to classify them. I guess most of us have a restricted vocabulary and struggle to describe scents. Whereas experts have been trained to recognise and name subtle nuances that pass the average person by. I remember trying to describe this white musk perfume I liked to a woman in a perfume shop and I was saying I wanted something dark, deep and heavy but she actually saw the perfume I was after as light, sweet and fluffy. I'd imagined the word musk described the exact opposite. According to the programme, one thing people tend to feel pretty certain about is their ability to spot the difference between a natural and synthetic aroma. Yeah, synthetic smells are so fake. Well, they've done tests and take, for example, lime essential oil, which is sharply intense. The vast majority of subjects in the lab actually identify it as smelling chemical, while the artificial odour, lime oxide, is seen as smooth and natural. And there's this chemical that has an almond-like smell, and it's universally seen as natural, apart from by chemists and chefs. How interesting. So, was the programme all about smell then? It was a big focus. It also dealt with human and animal brains. Way back, there was this scientist who found that the brain region in humans that processes odour detection is smaller, relative to total brain volume, than in dogs or rats. New findings show the number of neurons, you know, nerve cells in the brain, related to smell is remarkably consistent across mammals. Of course, you have to be careful of what you read into measurements and how they're used. Mice have more genes for smelling than humans, so that's seen as a sign of their superiority. But it may be that there isn't a tight relationship between genes and ability. There are likely to be new studies in the future that tell us more. The review I read said there was some stuff about music in the brain. Yeah, about our ability to pay attention to working or studying while listening to music. Personally, if I'm trying to study, music either takes me over emotionally or I start to analyse it. True. I like music too much not to pay attention to it, whatever its quality and whatever I'm doing, unfortunately. But there are those who find it impossible to work without playing music. Different strokes for different folks. I know a classically trained musician who just can't work without headphones on. Music's a language and it's virtually impossible to concentrate on two at the same time without losing details of one or both. If we all went back to paying attention to one thing at a time, our awareness would be much deeper, music included. Some people claim the internet's changing how our brains work. That's what the next episode's about with a focus on the human brain in response to new technology. It's essential to be conscious of the fact that we're used to dealing with a constant stream of information. After all, that's what the real world is, as far as our senses are concerned, either staring at a tennis video game or actually on the court playing. The brain does the same amount of work. Both activities are providing detailed sensory information, Fortunately, the brain doesn't bother to process absolutely everything that comes in. It filters things out and uses a sort of best guess of what's important. It's already well adapted to prevent information overload, so it's unlikely the internet would cause such a thing. I do feel panicked by the amount of information out there sometimes. <sighs> Always running just to stand still. Well, there's a lot to learn out there. Now listen again. So, Alan, did you see the latest episode of The Sensing Brain? Yes, Jolie. 
It was interesting. So I gather from the reviews. I missed it, so you can tell me about it, though I'll probably watch it online. There was this woman who's an expert on perfume making and runs workshops on the subject. It seems humans can improve their sense of smell fairly rapidly with practice. Even those who are convinced they've got a terrible one can prove pretty adept if they apply themselves. I wonder if it's like music. If you haven't studied or listened to a lot, you're hard pushed to spot the difference between a clarinet and an oboe. But once you've put in some time, you can distinguish them effortlessly. Apparently so, even if you haven't done specialist training. I learned a bit about perfumes, actually. There's an amazing range of terms to classify them. I guess most of us have a restricted vocabulary and struggle to describe scents. Whereas experts have been trained to recognise and name subtle nuances that pass the average person by. I remember trying to describe this white musk perfume I liked to a woman in a perfume shop and I was saying I wanted something dark, deep and heavy but she actually saw the perfume I was after as light, sweet and fluffy. I'd imagined the word musk described the exact opposite. According to the programme, one thing people tend to feel pretty certain about is their ability to spot the difference between a natural and synthetic aroma. Yeah, synthetic smells are so fake. Well, they've done tests and take, for example, lime essential oil, which is sharply intense. The vast majority of subjects in the lab actually identify it as smelling chemical, while the artificial odour, lime oxide, is seen as smooth and natural. And there's this chemical that has an almond-like smell, and it's universally seen as natural, apart from by chemists and chefs. How interesting. So, was the programme all about smell then? It was a big focus. It also dealt with human and animal brains. Way back, there was this scientist who found that the brain region in humans that processes odour detection is smaller, relative to total brain volume, than in dogs or rats. New findings show the number of neurons, you know, nerve cells in the brain, related to smell is remarkably consistent across mammals. Of course, you have to be careful of what you read into measurements and how they're used. Mice have more genes for smelling than humans, so that's seen as a sign of their superiority. But it may be that there isn't a tight relationship between genes and ability. There are likely to be new studies in the future that tell us more. The review I read said there was some stuff about music in the brain. Yeah, about our ability to pay attention to working or studying while listening to music. Personally, if I'm trying to study, music either takes me over emotionally or I start to analyse it. True. I like music too much not to pay attention to it, whatever its quality and whatever I'm doing, unfortunately. But there are those who find it impossible to work without playing music. Different strokes for different folks. I know a classically trained musician who just can't work without headphones on. Music's a language and it's virtually impossible to concentrate on two at the same time without losing details of one or both. If we all went back to paying attention to one thing at a time, our awareness would be much deeper, music included. Some people claim the internet's changing how our brains work. That's what the next episode's about with a focus on the human brain in response to new technology. It's essential to be conscious of the fact that we're used to dealing with a constant stream of information. After all, that's what the real world is, as far as our senses are concerned, either staring at a tennis video game or actually on the court playing. The brain does the same amount of work. Both activities are providing detailed sensory information, Fortunately, the brain doesn't bother to process absolutely everything that comes in. It filters things out and uses a sort of best guess of what's important. It's already well adapted to prevent information overload, so it's unlikely the internet would cause such a thing. I do feel panicked by the amount of information out there sometimes. <sighs> Always running just to stand still. Well, there's a lot to learn out there. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks.
You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about working as actors. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what has helped the speaker to succeed. Now look at task two. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H what each speaker regrets about the past. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part four. Speaker 1 I've always been a conscientious person. I trained in music and it was my talent for singing that drew me into the theatre. I started to act in plays with roles that involved singing, loved the acting side and went on to train to be an actor. It took a lot of persistence to get the parts I get. There were lots of setbacks, but I hung on and just kept at it. It's taken time, but now I'm never short of work. I was always determined to get better parts than anyone else when I was younger, which is something I feel uncomfortable thinking about now. I was very single-minded, you might say. Speaker 2 This career's all about doing new things and meeting new people. I had so much fun training to be an actor. That's not to say I wasn't fully committed to my studies. I was. It's been a struggle getting to where I am today. I was devastated when a film I almost appeared in won dozens of awards. I completely misjudged the script when I said no to a major part. If only I could rewrite history. That was a bit of a one-off, as normally I'm only too happy not to play it safe. I thrive on working in drama that pushes the boundaries and challenges accepted norms. That's probably my biggest asset, actually. Speaker 3 As an actor, I've always preferred the theatre to film. I love the buzz of an audience. I really should have made more of my music and drama degree, but I got in with a crowd of mates and we, let's say live life to the full, you know, staying up all night and stuff. It's not that we didn't want to do well, just we were overconfident, I guess. Anyway, I'm lucky enough to have performed with some great people, especially in comedy. Directors seem to spot how outgoing I am. I'll do pretty much anything and not get hung up about looking silly. That quality of mine has served me pretty well, actually. Speaker 4 I'd always enjoyed acting and drama, so it was a mystery to everyone when I opted to do a law degree. I put everything I had into it, but soon realised I'd never make it to the end of the course. It wasn't me, and it took me a while to realise that. I've been told I've got a magnetic personality and maybe that's why this friend's dad, who was a director, wanted me for a part in his film. Anyway, the film won an award and I haven't looked back. Offers of work keep rolling in. I haven't had to be ruthless to get where I am, fortunately. Competing against others is something I detest. Speaker 5 I'm quite a shy person, but in fact my cool exterior is deceptive. I'm pretty intense about my work. I knew from the beginning I'd go on the stage, and I threw myself into my degree in performing arts. 
The role that first got me noticed was in a soap opera. I wish I'd been a bit more accepting of colleagues in the early days, though. Nothing anyone did seemed good enough. I was such a perfectionist. My devotion to developing what I do feels like a never ending process, but it's what got me where I am today. I want to do more musicals, so I'm working on my singing voice at the moment. Now listen again. Speaker 1 I've always been a conscientious person. I trained in music, and it was my talent for singing that drew me into the theatre. I started to act in plays with roles that involved singing, loved the acting side, and went on to train to be an actor. It took a lot of persistence to get the parts I get. There were lots of setbacks, but I hung on and just kept at it. It's taken time, but now I'm never short of work. I was always determined to get better parts than anyone else when I was younger, which is something I feel uncomfortable thinking about now. I was very single minded, you might say. Speaker 2 This career is all about doing new things and meeting new people. I had so much fun training to be an actor. That's not to say I wasn't fully committed to my studies. I was. It's been a struggle getting to where I am today. I was devastated when a film I almost appeared in won dozens of awards. I completely misjudged the script when I said no to a major part. If only I could rewrite history. That was a bit of a one off, as normally I'm only too happy not to play it safe. I thrive on working in drama that pushes the boundaries and challenges accepted norms. That's probably my biggest asset, actually. Speaker 3 As an actor, I've always preferred the theatre to film. I love the buzz of an audience. I really should have made more of my music and drama degree, but I got in with a crowd of mates and we, let's say, live life to the full, you know, staying up all night and stuff. It's not that we didn't want to do well, just we were overconfident, I guess. Anyway, I'm lucky enough to have performed with some great people, especially in comedy. Directors seem to spot how outgoing I am. I'll do pretty much anything and not get hung up about looking silly. That quality of mine has served me pretty well, actually. Speaker 4 I'd always enjoyed acting and drama, so it was a mystery to everyone when I opted to do a law degree. I put everything I had into it, but soon realised I'd never make it to the end of the course. It wasn't me, and it took me a while to realise that. I've been told I've got a magnetic personality, and maybe that's why this friend's dad, who was a director, wanted me for a part in his film. Anyway, the film won an award, and I haven't looked back. Offers of work keep rolling in. I haven't had to be ruthless to get where I am, fortunately. Competing against others is something I detest. Speaker 5 I'm quite a shy person, but in fact my cool exterior is deceptive. I'm pretty intense about my work. I knew from the beginning I'd go on the stage, and I threw myself into my degree in performing arts. The role that first got me noticed was in a soap opera. I wish I'd been a bit more accepting of colleagues in the early days, though. Nothing anyone did seemed good enough. I was such a perfectionist. My devotion to developing what I do feels like a never ending process, but it's what got me where I am today. I want to do more musicals, so I'm working on my singing voice at the moment. That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left 
so that you're sure to finish in time.